enjoy and best of luck. Hey, thank you everyone for coming. I know it's kind of late after lunch on a Friday, so maybe not the most exciting time, but we'll try to make this uh, exciting and interesting. There are some technical details, so I hope you can derive some pleasure from that. So today we're going to talk about a tokenization system that we built at Chime. Uh, quick intros, my name is Javon. I'm a security engineer at Chime. Uh, I've been there for a couple of years, so I like building security stuff. I like breaking stuff. It's been a while, um, but I also like dabbling in some applied crypto. I started off as a more of offensive security researcher, just finding bugs, but eventually wanted to start building systems to prevent those bugs. Uh, we also have Yadi. Uh, he is a software engineer. He focuses on building big systems at Chime and making sure those all works with card processing and payments. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting at Chime is we do have a central security team, but all of our important product teams have an embedded security engineer in that team. So they get to partner with the product team and figure out exactly what they're working on to help them identify security issues. So here's the quick agenda. We have a couple of main components here. We'll try to get through everything. If we can't, we can just meet up outside and talk through some more things. So if you're not familiar with Chime, it's an online financial technology company. We're technically not a bank, but we do a lot of things that banks would do. So from the end, of our, from the end point of our users, they log into our app. They can use their card to buy things at a coffee shop. Um, and for a long time, we tried very hard to not deal with credit card numbers and debit card numbers. I think it's kind of obvious we didn't want to deal with the PCI burden and also the extra risk. Uh, but we had more and more use cases where we needed to store credit cards and debit card numbers in our environment. So these are a couple of the different use cases we had. But essentially, we had some easy things like on new, when someone joins the company, when someone joins up as a new member, they get a new card. Obviously, that card has a card number. And we wanted to actually do things with that card number, like make new products, offer them different things. Um, and then there's also this cashback rewards thing. So you imagine if you go to the petrol station or the gas station, you swipe your card, you get some money back, or you get some points. Um, the way that you do that is you connect to Visa or MasterCard, or one of those card networks, but you use your card number to identify that card. So without being able to send that information to the card networks, we wouldn't be able to offer the rewards to the customer. And then the last thing is digital cards, and we can talk about that later. But essentially, most of these online banks or technology companies will let you look at your digital card on your app, and it has the card number. So again, that was another use case for it. OK, so we talked about a little bit about why we needed it. I think the big elephant in the room is PCI. So there's a lot of burden when you have to do with PCI stuff. This is not a talk about PCI, so don't get excited. Um, but essentially, there are going to be, in addition to just normal security, like common sense, now we have penalties and regulations where we have to protect the card a certain way. Um, as many of you are familiar with PCI, obviously it's the card number, it's the PIN, it's the CVV, all these funny things on the card, and then the magnetic strip. So there are certain things we can keep and certain things we can't keep. Where's the how do I thank you? Okay, so maybe uh, we don't have to read all these slides and all that, but I think the biggest thing to understand is going to be this thing called token index tokens. All that really means is tokenization. It's one way to obfuscate the card number. So they tell you a certain a certain uh, different ways to do that. You can use encryption, you can use hashing, or you can use this thing called index tokens. So index tokens is, are a way for you to obfuscate that card number uh, by having a completely separate token where you can dereference the, the card. Um, one of the ways this is good is that it gets the card number out of your environment, but also um, prevents any kind of uh, security risks if that token was leaked. So the idea is that if someone had this token, they couldn't go back and get the card number from it. Yeah, how do I, okay, there we go. 
Okay, so uh, so a as an example, you have tokenization right there on the screen. So imagine this is a uh, this is a fake credit card number. It's not mine, so please don't use it. Um, but imagine this is a real card number. Tokenization is pr is pretty open. You could do a lot of things. You can even have some parts of the card number inside of the token. You can pre you can prefix it. You can suffix it. You can make it a UUID. Uh, but essentially, it's there's a lot of things you can do. It's pretty flexible based on your use case. Uh, this is just one example. O over here in this graphic, this is I think we're all familiar. I don't have to step through it. But imagine you're going on a website. You want to make a payment, and this is kind of the flow that would happen. Um, so essentially, when you put your card number um, inside of a web app, usually that's in an iframe. And that iframe is, let's, let's say you're going to, uh, I don't know, what's a McDonald's. I don't know, let's say you're buying a, a, a Big Mac on a McDonald's. So you want to go make an order, uh, you put your card number in. Usually where they have the payment details, that's in an iframe. That's not hosted on McDonald's, it's hosted on some other third party. And that third party will use some information to tokenize that card number and then send it off to get verified. So what's cool about that is that like, McDonald's gets to get rid of any PCI scope from their systems, and this token gets sent all the way to the card processing companies, and it gets handled there. Okay, so that's kind of a high level of why we needed it. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Yadi to talk about the architecture. Everybody can hear me? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody can hear me. All right. Awesome. So thank you, Jovan, for talking us through tokenization. I'm going to talk about the system and architecture about how we built our tokenization system within Chime. That was pretty cool. We made that giphy like two hours ago. Uh, so um, when we talk about system architecture, the very first few things that we have to talk about is how do we secure the network layer and what is our authentication on our authorization scheme? So that is where we decided to start off when we were writing the technical design doc and also the architecture diagram for this. So in here, this is going to be the theme across all this entire architecture diagram slides, is that we'll have this consistent theme that we're always thinking about our network and we're always thinking about our firewall configurations as well as our auth in and auth C. So when we built this system, at each layer there's different forms of authorization and authentication. So at the core system, there's a very, uh, there's a private sort of network or private cloud that houses the tokenization system and internal clients can access it through an AWS private link. And that AWS private link will basically allow you to have that a VPC from the internal client to the ingress of the Kubernetes uh, instance, which we'll show in a bit. So, um, Jovan went over the use cases, but let's talk about what they kind of break down to within Chime. They break down into profile management, so if you need to tokenize anything about the profile. Card management, like we talked about, PAN is one of those PCI items that we want to tokenize and make it tokenized, and then reporting, because one of the things that we have to do as a compliant Neo bank is that we have to report on how the cards are used to our uh, partner banks and our partner institutions. And the communication that goes into the uh, tokenization system is one of three ways, um, HTTPS, um, um, twerp, if anybody here is not familiar with twerp, is basically an RPC protocol that uses protobuf that has a defined schema and layout. So we always know what the endpoint and the request format is like. Um, if you guys are familiar with open API, it's pretty similar. Um, so it does pretty much a lot of the same things. And then we have message queues that we use SQS inside this case for async messages that we go ahead and process that do not rely on real time processing. So we have these three. Uh, to give kind of a clue, like we have profile management when a new member enrolls, we're going to capture their information and tokenize it in real time, so that'll come in through our HTTPS system. Anything that's async will go into our message queues, and then that'll be tokenized sort of async um, as it comes in through. So, And then inside of our private network, this is kind of where we split out this tokenization service, depending on its core capability. So we have the API, which that gets housed, the file processing, and then, like Jovan alluded to, and we'll get into later on inside these slides, we also have a web app as well. And then this is all behind a protobuf schema and or standard API schema that uh, is actually uh, source controlled and uh, type controlled as well. And then we have the core. And we really utilize three 
main resources at AWS, S3 for storing files for reporting. We also use KMS, our key management system. Um, we use this through um, AWS, and we also use Aurora Postgres, which we'll get into uh, when we talk about token generation. And then as this communication is actually coming through, when we think about Authn and AuthC, we think about it based off of who's the actor that's actually engaging with us. So if you're a human, it goes through Okta. If it's a service-to-service -service communication, so if you're really deep down into the stack, we have a uh, concept called S2S, which is service-to-service -service authentication, where we actually get the service identity and that is passed along inside the header into the request that comes into the core of the service. And then lastly, we have our outbound traffic. Um, one of the functionalities that we do have is proxying if we want to communicate with the outside world uh, with this um, token value. So that either goes out through HTTPS if it's, uh, if it's a sync call and uh, SSH or SFTP if it's for file processing if we want to report to our partner banks. And then that's just the external clients. So, if we logically group them, this is what the components sort of look like of the system that we built. And now that we have grouped them, we can now think about what the threat model or the vulnerabilities where they could arise. And that's how we've been logically grouping and identifying where our weak points in our system could be. So, but at the core, our, everything comes down to we should be able to encrypt or create a token. We should be able to decrypt. Uh, we should be able to proxy, so we should be able to take a token and send it to some destination in a safe and secure way. We should also be able to query. Uh, I'm going to allude to this more and talk about it later. Uh, query just means that we should be able to take some value and associate it with some tokens out of our system, and we should be able to file process or basically report on these. So I'm going to let Jovan talk about token generation, and then I'll come back to you guys for data storage. Cool. Thanks, Yadi. Okay, so we're not cryptographers. Uh, a lot of this crypto is kind of boring, but I think one of the issues we have with crypto is like, cool, I can encrypt a piece of data with a key, but then I need to protect that key. Okay, so I protected that key. I need to protect that key that I just encrypted. And then I need to protect that key. And you keep on going, you keep on going. So you kind of have this hierarchy of keys, but you know, what key do you protect if you have to protect the key? So what that means for us is we're using a we're using a thing called uh, let's see envelope encryption. But what we're, what we're trying to display here on the bottom is we have our token. For us, it's a PAN, but it could also be a social security number or an ITIN, some type of national identifier. We take a data key, uh, we use AES, and we encrypt that. And obviously, you get your encrypted data. That's pretty standard. Um, but when we're using envelope encryption, we have almost like a parent key or a root key, and that key protects the data key. And then you still have your encrypt, now you have an encrypted data key and you have an encrypted data. So these two pieces of data is what gets stored in our database. Uh, we'll go through it a little bit later, but this is probably the most important thing. So this encryption key, this is like the keys to the kingdom. If this gets lost, then you're kind of screwed because it could decrypt any of the data encryption keys. Okay, so then, you know, do we need a specialized database? Um, yeah, so um, do we need a specialized database? I'm just gonna piggyback off that. Um, the answer is no, not really. We could reuse a lot of what is available to us in open source. But when we think about storage, we also have to think about schema. Uh, what is our database requirements? How should we be actually storing it? And I alluded to this, but how do we query? Because we also need to build associations. This is particularly important for one of the uh, use cases that we'll go ahead and do a deep dive on. So we talk about token generation, but we also need to talk about how to store it. So um, in the schema, we kind of allude to how we uh, have stored it in a slightly more generic way. So you have your DEC ID, your encrypted value that we just talked about on the previous slide, um, the data family that we'll talk to in one second, um, and then the digest, the HMAC key, and then the uh, uh, HMAC version. So. HMAC is how we build associations between the value and 
the actual token so that if you give it the plain text value, you can see every single token variation that you have created. And then the deck ID tells you, hey, what ID of this deck actually created this encrypted value so that you can sort of decrypt it in a backwards way. And then when you talk about the deck, you also have to identify which type of CAC or key encryption key actually encrypted that deck. So you store the encrypted deck, you store the encrypted value, but you never store the key encryption key. That is safe and secure inside of your key management store, and only your app should have uh, access to that key, and it shouldn't be compromised. <clears throat> And you also tell it the data family for that data key. So you, uh, one of the design principles that we followed is that you shouldn't mix use cases between data families. So the data key that is used to encrypt pans, uh, that should not be the same data key that's used to, say, encrypt your national identifiers, so, so your social security number or your um, citizen number, things like that. Because if one gets compromised, it compromises your other data families as well. So uh, this is how we have chosen to actually like frame this. So we have the data family. So PAN is uh, primary account number. This is also synonymous in the States with the card number. So if you keep on hearing us say PAN, it's the same thing as the card number that you see on your actual card. And then the UUID that you see there is the token ID that you actually generate. So this is the thing that actually swims through all of the other systems that are not inside this tokenization system. So inside this internal system. So all the other subsystems will use this value to say that, hey, this is our token representation of this value. So if we ever need to get this value or report on this value, we'll just pass this PAN token with this, with this data family so that it could be decrypted or processed. So, um, Talked a lot. Um, we're developers here, so let's just go through a quick code exercise. Um, so we talked about our core functionalities, encrypt, decrypt, proxy, query, and file proxying. Um, we talked a lot about encryption, but let's also dive into decryption. Um, the sample codes that you're going to see here is with Go. I don't know if a lot of people have familiarity with Go, um, but it's a pretty uh, straightforward language. It's, it's almost like you could read it and, and uh, understand it. So this is the interface for the token handler and what it's supposed to do. So um, this is the sample code. So when we talk about encryption, the data key gets encrypted with the keck. The data key is also used to encrypt the data value that gets stored as well. So when you, we talk about decryption, we go from the token to get the token ID, and then we get the data from that ID, then we get the family, we validate the family, then we get the deck associated with that, and then we do the decryption of that value. But there's something not exactly right inside of this. Can anybody point out there's a slight logic bug inside of here? You cannot read the, the code. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Let me see if I can. And that doesn't help either. <laughs> so the general gist of the logic bug, maybe I can see it because I'm so upfront and close. But in step four, we get the data encryption key. And in step five, we never decrypt it just yet. So you actually have to decrypt the deck with your CAC before you can actually use it. So you do a decryption. And then you, after you've gotten that decryption, then you can use the deck. So because what you store inside your database for that data encryption key is its encrypted value. So you always have to decrypt it. All right. So let's talk about challenges. We faced a lot of challenges during this project from a security standpoint, but I want to highlight just two uh, that we faced and we were able to resolve. The first one is our data uh, is to determine the reuse policy for our data encryption keys and our HMACs. So HMACs helps us build the associations. The data encryption key helps us encrypt the data. So in an ideal world, to reduce the blast radius of a compromise, if the data encryption key somehow got decrypted, right? you would have one deck for one plain text value. And that would be an ideal world. This is, unfortunately, not a great member experience for the live system. As if you have a lot of people onboarding onto your system, that means every single time that they onboard, 
They have to create a new data encryption key, so that's not ideal either. The opposite side of that is that you have one deck for all of them. Uh, this is also terrible. Beyond just the, the limitations of AES, this is also terrible because if that deck ever gets compromised, then all of your, uh, uh, all of your tokenized values can get compromised as well, so that's not ideal. So you, we had to strike a balance in between that delights the customer, but it still has us in a much better security posture and state. So that was the first challenge. The second challenge is detokenization or the process of decrypting a large file. So we have to report to the bureaus, our partner institutions, about how our cards are being used at what velocity for which purchases. So we have to hand over that PAN information. So these are very large files in, in the gigabytes. Um, we naively, like, when you develop, you develop the naive solution first and then you iterate towards perfection or betterment. Um, and we were doing uh, sequential de uh, detokenization. So you can imagine in a file of uh, 30 million tokens to detokenize, that could become very time consuming. So this operation, before we optimize it, took, um, like eight or nine hours. So just be mindful that uh, detokenization, yeah, see, I already see some buzzers shaking some hands. Yeah, it was a very naive implementation. But we got around this in a few ways, including caching, sharding the, the, the file, and then doing parallel um, or concurrent uh, detokenization. And we got this down to below 30 minutes, below 10 minutes now. So, uh, so uh, that's one of the other uh, performance improvements that we've done. So that's some of the challenges. I'm going to popcorn it off to Jovan to kind of talk us through a use case and threat model. And he will talk about the web app that we built and what uh, was going on there. So, <clears throat> Thank you. So this was originally supposed to be a builder track, but they put us in the breaker room. So I apologize if you guys were looking for some cutting edge uh, breakage, but we'll try to get to some of that. So in this next part of the slide, we're going to go through one of our, our use cases that's kind of interesting. So we have uh, police officers or uh, law enforcement that will find a card number during an investigation. So maybe they found some bad person's computer and they found a whole bunch of credit cards on their computer when they dumped the memory on their hard drive. But they don't know who those card numbers belong to. Or they saw someone break into a local coffee shop, they use a card number, but they don't have the actual person that owns that card. So somehow they'll figure out that we are the ones that issued that card. And so if you look at the first six digits on your bank account card, it'll tell you who issued the card. Like it'll, you'll go to Visa and it'll say, oh, it was Chime or it was some other place. Um, so then the law enforcement will come to us and say, hey, we're going to give you these pans. You need to give us back the owner of the pans. And so we're required by law to uh, fulfill that request. And so what we do is we, we leverage that API that we just saw, or what we saw earlier called get tokens from value. So what I like to do is kind of step through this as far as a mini threat model and kind of break down all the different components there and see if we can find some of the issues that, some of the bugs there. So this is like a generic kind of cute picture of what this looks like. Um, I'll describe some of the components. So. Uh, we have, so this right here, you can't really see it. We thought we'd be on a bigger screen, so I apologize. Uh, this is a customer service web app. So we have people all over the world um, that are either contractors or temporary employees or even full-time employees, uh, but they're given a laptop and then they're given um, access to this internal app that we built. Think of it like an internal tools app that customer service reps would use. It's built... Um, and they use that app to then access another web service that's a web front end for our tokenization system. So that's what you'll see in orange on the bottom. Um, and then, then they'll access the API server, which is the one that will process the tokenization requests. So it'll do the encryption, the decryption, and the other stuff we talked about. Okay, so let's kind of break through in each one of these components. <clears throat> so this top component, like I said, it's, it's external. So that means that it's anywhere in the world. It's external to our Kubernetes cluster. It's not trusted, so to speak. But that web app that we talked about is built on Ruby on Rails. Uh, it's a really big app. We use it for a lot of stuff internally. The interesting bit 
that happens here is that the user that uses this laptop, obviously they're, they're going to log into our identity server. We use Okta, so they have SSO. Um, but they're also going to use something like a secured web browser to access our web app. So think of Chrome that's like super locked down. You can't run any scripts on there. You can't copy and paste. Um, but that's another control that we have. The next one is going to be the actual front-end web app for our tokenization system. This is a really simple app. I didn't want anything crazy happening here. I didn't want React or any fancy JavaScript frameworks. I just wanted something very simple. So for the web app, we actually went with Go and just used the templates inside of Go. And then we use standard or vanilla JavaScript uh, to handle any of that, that dynamic um, processing. Um, this also is in AWS and it uses EKS for their Kubernetes service and we have a simple load balancer. One second. Yeah, how do you? Okay. So we, we kind of talked through each of the components, but let's talk about how they connect. For those that can't see, I'm just going to kind of walk it through. So uh, we have the web server, like the, the customer service app. It's on an external system somewhere some other country, uh, they're going to connect to, they're going to authenticate to Okta. Obviously, they'll use SSL or TLS, username and password. They'll get back a JWT. Inside of that JWT, it'll have a claim that says that it can access this web app. Um, from there, they're going to access this web app uh, over, obviously, HTTPS using that JWT. What's actually interesting is that the CSR for it to access this web app, it loads an iframe. Um, I get, we talked about like the trade-offs for security and, and functionality. Uh, we initially wanted to pop up a, uh, have an opener and have a different login. Uh, but for user experience, it was better to just have an iframe and do like a silent login there. So we did iframe and you can imagine we'll have to do all the iframe security and sandbox controls. But that essentially makes a request to, uh, this, this system over here. And then once it validates the information, they can look up the pan and then this system will connect to using a service identity to the backend server to retrieve that pan, uh, retrieve the member information from that pan. Okay, so um, like I said, we're not going to do a heavy threat model, but normally we have these threat actors. Um, some interesting things that are, there, there's some nuances here, like your, this external attacker here is not just someone off of the internet. I'm considering someone that's external to the cluster. So they don't have access by default. Internal attackers, I'm thinking someone that got access to the cluster somehow. Um, it might not be allowed to be there, but somehow they got access to it. Then you'll have your internal system administrator or your SRE. They actually have permissions, but they shouldn't be using them. And the last person, you have your normal user that just uses the system as normal. Okay. So then let's kind of step through some of the attacker paths that one of these attackers would use. Okay, so let's go back to that external attacker. So let's just imagine that we said the external attacker is external to all the clusters. So they're not here, but imagine we have this, this other EKS cluster or some other cluster that's in the corporate network. It's trusted but not trusted to be here. And then let's say they hacked Okta or they... Uh, hacked uh, this laptop. Uh, does anyone have any ideas how a person or a, an, an, a hacker from those perspectives could get access to the to the web app? Yep. So for those that didn't hear, it's JWT. Uh, they're not the best uh, because there's a lot of replay attacks that could happen. Um, so yeah, JWT is one of them. Also, we we noticed as well with our libraries that some of the JWT libraries we looked at don't validate the none algorithm, 
or they, they allow the nun algorithm, so that's an issue as well. Then we have the replayability, and there's also some nuances with skew. How many people are familiar with like the skew of the, the, t the time for the validity of the JWT? Um, so a lot of the libraries you use, you'll have to check if it, what's the, I guess, uh, leniency with that skew. Some of the libraries we looked at, it was like an hour, and in some environments that's fine, but for us it wasn't. Um, and then the last thing I would say is like, the JWT spec doesn't require you to have an, an EXP claim inside of it. So some of the libraries you might use or you might write yourself, um, it might not check that by default. If it is there, then it'll, it will check it, but we've seen tokens that came through that didn't have that EXP, and in testing, they got allowed, so that was kind of a bummer, so we, we had to tighten that up a bit. But those are good, good explanations. Uh, some of the things we, we did do as well is we added rate limiting. So we have a couple points that's not really depicted here, but like through the infrastructure, we have some ingress access points, we have some firewalls, so we added some, um, some rate limiters. We also made very short uh, JWTs. We have client certificates on the devices. Obviously, if they're on the device, it doesn't matter. Um, and then also, we have some fine-grained authorization uh, based off of the claims that are inside the JWT. Okay. Let's try another one. Okay, so let's say... Let's say I'm an internal attacker, so I got access to the cluster. Now, I might not have authentication to the web app or to the backend API, but I don't know, maybe, maybe the infrastructure team made a boo-boo and allowed someone to get access to the cluster. Um, what are some of the threats that they could do here? Or what would you do? If you were on there and you were trying to steal payment card information, what would you do from there? Yep. So, said he would try to get database. He see he had a database connection, and uh, he's 100 percent right because on this server, uh, he's in the cluster. But on this server, obviously there has to be database credentials. So, if you're in that environment and you can pop that API server, then you'll get access to those credentials. Even if you use AWS Secrets Manager or some other product for secrets management, if you're there, you'll you can get access to it. So. Yes. So if you're if you're in the system and the deck's in memory, uh, you can dump it. Now it's a little bit harder in Go. Uh, a lot of like in Ruby, it's easy. You can run a Rails console and dump the variables. Uh, Go, or at least what we're using, we we don't have some of those uh, primitives in place, so which is good for us. But yeah, there are ways to get access to memory. Um, some of the infrastructure controls that we have is like most companies will, will use some type of. Uh, infrastructure management like Puppet, Chef, or, or Terraform. Uh, we also use very slim base images. So just a recommendation, I just had to go update an old image that used Python. There was know, like a thousand CVEs on there. So instead of updating all of those, it just used a new Alpine image or like a slim image. Um, these are all simple things, but I think what I'm trying to convey here is like at every single point in this infrastructure, in order to pass PCI and make sure we're safe at night, um, and our customers are not being stolen, we're, we're having to think about these things. Let's see, how are we doing on time? Oh, I, we're think, I, I think, yeah, there's still an open question, so Joe Bond. So the, the, uh, the KMS that we do use does use an HSM, but for the DEX, we don't use an HSM. Yes. The next question is how, yeah, okay, how frequently do you actually rotate the deck? Because, sorry, when he was presenting, one of the things that he said was that um, with the deck you had to reach a balance. Okay, either you generate one deck per tenant or you would use the same deck for all tenants. Both of them have problems. So it means that you need to frequently rotate your deck. Yes. Okay, to minimize blast radius. So, do you do that? Don't you do it? Did you end up deciding one-to-one -one or one-to-one with rotation? 
Yeah, so my initial response was to do one-to-one. -one. Um, there was some latency that was unfortunate with the onboarding. So we, we settled on, uh, 100. After every, after 100 uses, we rotate to a new deck. Um, so for some of you that are not, most of us are all familiar with AES and GCM and some of these, you know, ciphers and all of that. Some of the gotchas with AES or with GCM mode is that if you, I think with, uh, you can only use two to the 32 as far as the amount of times you can encrypt with one key, even if you use a different nonce. So when you're thinking about your, your rotation policy and your, your nonce usage and all of that, even if you use Cha Cha Poly, maybe, you know, they're okay. They're resistant to, they are resistant to nonce reuse. But if you're using something else, like let's say you're in a low powered environment or low computing environment and to have to use CBC with, uh, like an HMAC, HMAC on top of it, you'll need to figure out what's the right balance for your, your keys and your, um, uh, your nonces. Okay. This is kind of more of the same, but you know, if I'm if 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 you're an SRE or a server administrator, you can theoretically get access to all these systems. The way we solve that is that we have a just-in-time access system where no one has root by default. Um, even if you have root, there's a different role that actually gets you SSH into these systems. Um, because, like we said, if you're if you're if you're able to get onto one of these servers, you could probably read the environment variables or some other secret and grab it from there. So we use the just-in-time access. So someone has to submit a request via our access management system. It gets approved. So that's one kind of human control. As on top of that, the second thing is we use a, a like SSH proxy. So all of the actions are monitored. Maybe that's not the best kind of privacy thing, but it's also like a, a way for us to identify issues and do like some log-based monitoring um, if we see some type of anomalous behavior. Okay, lastly, uh, normal user, this one's kind of interesting. So a lot of times you hear about threat models where you have uh, nation states and uh, disgruntled employees and insider threats. We actually have these. Um, so long time ago, uh, we've had agents that were malicious on purpose. So they got hired on thinking they wanted to commit fraud. Uh, you can imagine there's a lot of fraud going on. Like Uber has fraud where there's like a ring of drivers. They all like kind of hang out together and they have like, you, I think we've all seen the pictures where there's one person with like 30 phones on their desk waiting to get a new Uber ride. Um, our version of fraud, at least in this case, is that someone gets hired in, they're already malicious to begin with, and they had not, and they get hired. They pass background checks and all that stuff. But now they're hired and now they have access to this system. So even though we have firewalls, multi-factor authentication, file integrity monitoring, they're authenticated. So for us, some of the things that we've had to do here is, um, obviously do some basic web security things. That was one of the reasons why we made the web app very simple. So, you know, I didn't want SQL injection. I didn't want cross-site scripting or any of those kind of other things there. Um, but we do have a detection on there. We have um, endpoint detection on the laptops, so we know what they're doing. And we also have a authorization queue that when someone is dealing with a one of these uh, cards, l let me put it a different way. If... If we didn't, ha we have an authorization system that says that they can only view a card that's in this investigation pool. If we didn't have that, they could iterate through all of the cards and retrieve tokens for those cards and then have an offline map for a token to PANS. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and wrap up and I'll give it back to Yadi. Hey. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, so some of the key takeaways um, that Jovan has alluded to, it's really important to have a, a strong key management system. Again, use robust libraries. Language choices do matter. So that's kind of why we went with Go um, as well. Uh, lots of observability um, on our resources, our, our endpoints, our traffic. Um, Jovan's a security engineer, um, a threat model, every single use case. 
um, and also centralized on approved use cases that we allow our application to do as well. So we have some core set of functionalities. Our business cases are growing as we have showcased this capability to the rest of the company. So our core functionalities are encrypt, decrypt, query, file processing. Rather than building out bespoke solutions for every single uh, org team or, 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 or team that would like to integrate with us, we give them kind of like a blessed use case, and then it's up to them to say that, hey, how do I work with this use case? Because we want to keep things simple and controlled. Um, also, uh, you guys saw our data family tokenization scheme. It was the PEN and then the UI, UID. This is the choice that we went with. This is not the choice that anybody has to hear, has to follow. Use what works for your own organization. But we found it very important to separate things out based off a of data family and having some way of tying this all together via a UUID. Um, security's never a done job, and so is this project. So it's always an ongoing thing. Um, we're moving towards fine grain authorization, even more fine grain than the queue that uh, Jovan has alluded to, more on that in the future. Um, improve the encrypted search. Currently, you could only query based off of the full value of the um, of the plain text that is entered in. So because I, we just query based off of the H, HMAC digest, so sometimes law enforcement will only have a certain amount of a card number. Say that they'll only have like the last six or something like that. So um, that's one of the things that we like to improve. Also, Historically, the way that we have viewed digital cards is through our vendor provider, uh, who has given us sort of like images of those cards. So we're also moving towards all systems going through us to detokenize, not just the people that have integrated. So um, basically, things we can only we could only actually view those pens through our systems for future use cases. So that's kind of the work that we're going on. Um, yeah, it's never a dumb battle, but it's the fight that we keep on pushing for. Um, Jovan, any comments on this? All right, well, if that's the case, I'm going to open up to the floor if anybody has questions. Thank you. Uh, let's go for questions. Uh, Thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the last example when you mitigate an issue with a thread actor that was hired and you tracked, and I'm just curious how you made this and what the malicious activity you tracked during this process. Yeah, so not only do we have anomaly detection, it's not like there's a frequent like case of like law enforcement coming to us every now and then. So if we're starting to see that, hey, an individual is suddenly requesting a hundred pan queries, right? That's kind of suspicious. Why are you looking for a hundred different, uh, why is one individual running a hundred different queries? Like why are we running a hundred different searches at once? At all, so it's not a frequent use case. So we have anomaly detection when we see, hey, we have spikes inside of our system. This is an indication that this is m m malicious as well. But we also have a queuing system to say that, hey, this is what's actually being requested by law enforcement. Yeah, I can add. So some more specific. So we use Datadog uh, internally, um, and so we set up thresholds and monitors. So for all of our systems, we use data for normal stuff. Uh, but I think one thing that's good about being embedded with the product team is that we try to make uh, security more of a data model. So if we see those thresholds and, and we set up a threshold like from the same IP and same user ID, no more than, I don't know, 20 requests per hour, uh, if that exceeds, then we know something's off. So we'll see an alert. The on-call person is going to triage that. There's a run book that says, you know, this could be a problem, and then we'll have security operations reach out to that person. Because we manage that laptop, we can kill their, uh, we can kill, we can revoke their uh, client certificate and their authentic and um, their access like to the firewall. So we have some network controls that we can toggle as well. Uh, but that's how we get visibility into that. Uh, that's, I don't know what happened after that. So, <laughs> I, I know we, uh, so we, we had to involve, uh, investigations to see what happened, and they're the ones that will track the IP, find out where that person is located, and then, you know, engage legal. I wasn't part of, uh, of that part. 
Hey, great job. Um, how are you thinking or how have you thought about supply chain risk throughout the whole architecture? Cool. Yeah. Um, so the way we think about supply chain risk, uh, right now we have, I mean, you saw the, we own our infrastructure or the images and we own the applications. So for each one of those, we have like thousands of alerts. I'm sure everyone does. They wake up in the morning, they'll see all these CVEs for outdated packages. So for our app stuff or our code, we've leveraged Dependabot for a lot of the things because we, because I think we have pretty good hygiene with that. It's never a breaking change. So because we're, we're updating our packages quite often, um, we also use some third party products for our infrastructure. So it'll tell us what happens. Um, one of the more, but it's hard to do that manually. I think one of the easy things for us is on every single deploy, the image gets updated. So instead of like a patch Tuesday or anything like that, it just kind of automatically gets baked into, um, into the build pro, into the, the build and deploy process. Okay, if no one else has questions, let's wrap it up and, uh, okay, we have time for one more. Yeah, uh, hello, thank you for the talk. Uh, I just have two questions about the last thing you mentioned. Uh, so you said that you own the images, so like you have your own, I don't know, Kubernetes or Docker images, like, or how do you, and you maintain those where you deploy all the applications? So we have a, do you want to take this? So we don't use the public repository for images. So okay. we have ECR mirrors of those images, right? So, and then on every single build, we also store that image into our repository as well. So that's what he was trying to say by that. Okay. And uh, the other question is about the, you said that the CSR you mentioned, or this kind of first application, it was on Ruby on Rails. And is it like a monolith with more stuff or is it just uh, kind of like a, just back an application with yes a console. How does it look? Let's say. Yeah. So. And why choosing? Yeah. So the app itself is a Go binary that executes on the server. So, uh, so it's basically a binary that it's embedded into the uh, Docker instance itself. So there is not a thing that's actually executable for you. There is no Ruby there. It's now. Oh. Oh, 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 the penny. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, okay. so there's, so it, it's kind of a weird, like when you saw the architecture diagram, it's not like a, you know, a normal three tier thing. It's like a web app, another web app, and then your back end, and then your database. So the reason we have the CSR, the, the front, the, 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 oh, let's put it on. One second. How do I go back? You're talking about the one in the green, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's a legacy system. Um, that's, if if the pan if the tokenization system wasn't alive, that system does everything else. You call in as a member, like, oh hey, uh, I want to update my name, or I want to change my phone number, or, or something like that. So that's like our internal system that handles any support call. One of the support calls could be um, update. I have a new card. I need to update it, or I have a new pin. So they leverage that same system to implement these searches. Uh, this investigation search. But to your point, yes, it's a older system. It's built Ruby on Rails. Um, it's in a separate, uh, AWS account. Um, we split the, the front end from the back end. So the front end's all compiled. They get it from our, our caching layer and they can execute it in the browser. Cool. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, everyone. Thank you. Uh, and now uh, it's actually a goodbye. So a uh, round of applause for Yadi and the one. <laughs>